It is entitled The Call of Wisdom. This is lesson one in the summer quarter. Now, first of all, we want to be able to distinguish what wisdom is. And ever since I've been uh, a little boy, I've always tried to read, to understand, and apply words in a way that I can understand them. Now, there's a formal definition of it, but basically, what wisdom is, it takes instructions, and through the aid of the Holy Spirit, it teaches you how to apply those instructions in day-to-day -day life. Many of us come to church, and the question is posed at one point in time, why do we need to come to church? And what do we do once we leave the church? Well, one of the reasons that we come to church is we want to learn, first of all, what thus says the Lord. Second of all, we come here because not only do we want to learn what thus says the Lord, but we want to be able to apply it. Because we can't mix what we want to do and what God will have us to do together. The two will create a disastrous thing. For example, if you were baking a cake and you substituted salt for sugar or sugar for salt, the result wouldn't be the same. Can you imagine how your cake would taste if you took the sugar out and put salt in this place? Or if you was making a chocolate cake and instead of you using chocolate, you put in something else like mint. You know, or you just eliminated chocolate all together, you wouldn't have the same results. So if we're going to pattern our life according to the precepts of God, if we're saying that the Holy Spirit is our rule, our guide, and our comforter, then we have to learn to do what thus says the Lord. This lesson begins in Proverbs is an instruction manual in wisdom. Now, many of you may wonder, well, how do I get wisdom? How do I obtain wisdom? The word of God is simple. It's straight to the point. It says that if you lack wisdom, all you have to do is ask God. And God is willing to give it to you freely, without cost to you, and the Holy Spirit will instruct you on how to do it. I also want to submit to you that wisdom comes with an experience. And that's not just limiting you to a certain age, but it comes through experiencing situations in life. You know what to say, what not to say, what to do, and what not to do. But if you ask God for wisdom, he will definitely give it to you because he's no respect of person. Wisdom is also one of the spiritual gifts. Uh, if you have not taken the spiritual gift inventory, this is an awesome tool that you can use to help identify what may be your spiritual gift. Now, the true confirmation comes from God, but I want to submit to you that the word of wisdom, word of knowledge are, in fact, spiritual gifts. And if we are going to operate spiritually, we need to have an idea of what God has gifted us. And each and every one of us has at least one spiritual gift. If you would like information on that, I encourage you to get with your church leaders, your church officials, or you can just simply Google it online. There are a lot of free resources on that. And then get with somebody so that you can get deeper instruction. Proverbs is written as an instruction manual. Now, the author is credited to be uh, Solomon, but deep discussion reveals that it's probably written by many more people. Some say it has parts written by wise men, other kings, or other people of influence. But whatever it is, it is an invaluable tool. Now, join with me as we begin to study it identifies that it's the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom, for gaining instruction, understanding, and insight. That's the second verse. Second verse identifies that we need to gain wisdom. That means we know what to do when we receive instructions. Now, we also need to get some instructions. It doesn't matter which station you are at in life. It is necessary that you have instructions on whatever it is that you're doing. 
If you are going to school, you go there to follow a discipline or a prescribed manner of instruction. If you want to play professional sports, no matter what you know when you move to the next level, you have to show up for practice because you want to be instructed on how to perform or what is expected of you during game day. Finally, the instruction also gives you understanding. It's a great thing not only to be instructed, but to know why you must do a certain thing. For example, I found out that the reason why when rolling out a dough, that mom used to put flour on the rolling pin. It enables the rolling pin to roll more smoothly without the dough sticking to it. But in order to get this tidbit of information, you have to hang around the kitchen. You have to have what the Bible calls a teachable spirit. You have to be willing to let someone teach you before you go out all, all willy-nilly and doing things yourself. Now, it also says that not only after we get understanding, but we get some insight. Now, we're not supposed to stay on the same level year after year. We grow up. For example, no one stays in the first grade for 12 years of school. No one stays at the junior high level for 12 years. You are expected to move in a certain amount of time. The average school year is nine months. The average college curriculum is four years. Some can finish in three, some take five. But the standard is that you finish what's known as a four-year degree within that time period of four years. It stands to reason that when we come to church, we should be growing. This is the reason why we have Sunday school, why we have Bible study, why we have all the different types of auxiliaries, so that we can get this instruction, we can get insight, we can get wisdom, and we can get understanding. Not only is it important for us to get these things, but as we look at the fourth verse, it gives us prudence to those that are simple, knowledge and discernment and discretion to the young. Now what does that mean? It gives us some bounds to follow. It stops us from just doing and saying what we want to do and say. For example, if you're driving down the road, there's a center line. Some lanes are marked by a dashed line. Some lanes are marked by a double yellow line. Some lanes permit you to cross and change lanes and move from one area to another. Some lanes you have to stay in. You have to be restricted because if you cross over from your side to another side, you could very well cause an accident. Wisdom also gives us the ability to recognize when we are gone wrong, when we have made a mistake. Now, if you're under the sound of my voice this morning, I want to submit to you that the Word of God says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How do you know when you've made a mistake? How do you know when you need to ask God for forgiveness? Well, there's something within you called the Holy Spirit. Some people refer to it as a spiritual check. Sometimes when you do things, regardless of whether you know that they are right, or wrong or indifferent, something goes off inside you that says, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have thought that. Maybe I should listen before I speak. And when you get that spiritual check, it's a good time, it's a good idea to pray about that thing because now God will begin to give you wisdom and instruction on it. Later on in the lesson, I want to share with you how circumstances can lead us to make unwise decisions. The seventh verse says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What does it mean, the fear of the Lord? Fear of the Lord in this case simply means that we have respect and reverence for God. We have respect and reverence for God's house for the people that he has placed in positions of leadership and authority, not only in the church, but in our household. Not only in our household, but on our place of employment. Not only on our place of employment, but our local officials, our government leaders. 
we don't have to agree with everything they say, but we have to carry our manner in a way that's respected. The Word of God simply says that obedience is better than sacrifice. All of us that have attained at least a certain age realize that sometimes we are asked to do things that we don't necessarily agree in doing. Having served in the military, the oath of enlistment states that we will follow the lawful orders of the officers and the non-commissioned officers appointed over us. But I want to submit something more in detail to you. The way that you treat people when you are following their orders is the way that they'll treat you once you get to a position of leadership. And you need to be mindful that the word of God is true. You do reap what you sow. It's important that we stay prayed up. It's important that we be led by the Holy Spirit in how we do things. The purpose of having fear for God is to reverence who God is. We just can't say what we want to say, do what we want to do because we think it's right. The Word of God said there's a consequence for that. And when we see things going wrong in our society and we wonder why are we in this situation, we have to think about what we said. We have to think about what we did. Now, some people may not agree with it, but there are rules that we have to follow. Whether you know them or not, you're still bound by these rules. When we took prayer out of schools, we damaged generations. When we gave rights, you know, to people, you know, without considering God in the process, we cause people to have hurt and harm. So we have to learn to seek God. And in seeking him, in the fear and the reverence for him, seeking him does not mean we go to God with our mind already made up and, and then we come back and say, this is what God wants us to do. When you go to God, you go before him empty. You go before God and you simply say, hey, Lord, we're dealing with this situation. We're dealing with this circumstance. But we want you to help us to get beyond this matter so that we know that we are on the right track. And whatever you say do, Lord, we are willing to do. Consider the children of Israel. Now, the children of Israel wanted to be free. And so when, when Moses freed them on the instructions and the purposes of God, when they got in the wilderness, when they got in the desert, they began to question, where we go get the water from? Where we go get the meat from? And when God began to supply them, they still had issues. You know, they got to the point that they were tired of eating the very thing that sustained them. So when God make a way for you, wisdom will cry out to you that, hey, this is a way that you didn't make yourself. It may not be what you like or what you want, but this is what God has given you at this time to sustain you. So the fear of the God is the beginning of understanding and the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now this part of the verse is inserted there because the scripture says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Have you ever talked to someone and you mention what God is doing and they conclude the, the conversation by saying, but God is not a conditional God. If he says he's going to do it, there is no but. If he says it's going to be, that's exactly what it's going to be. When you start to talk about God and you put but in the sentence or you have doubt in your mind, that is a sign of disbelief and unbelief. The word says that fools have already said that God does not exist. And what it means is that not only are they saying that God don't exist, but the problem is bigger than God. I want to submit to you, yes, there are some things that's hard in life. There are some things that's difficult in life. But there is no problem, no circumstance, no encounter that you can face that's bigger than God. If God don't have the answer, then the answer don't exist. So we have to learn how to trust him, how to depend upon him, even in the most difficult of times. It says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Now, this is an Old Testament scripture, but it has New Testament implications. 
The word of God says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth. The reason that it says this is because it is the road map. It is the prescription. It's the sewing pattern for your life. The reason that they want you to honor thy father is because the father gives instruction. The father is the one that provides the covering for the household. The father is the one that tells you, yea, son, if you do A, B, C, and D, you can get this. When you get off track, as the prodigal son did, when you return back home, the father is the one that welcomes you back into sonship. Same relation that we have with our father, our heavenly father. When we get off track, and the Holy Spirit urges and builds us back into place, into relationship. The Son is there, Father, to draw us back to the Father, back to the heart of the Father. And see, Jesus has already made it clear, he's already proclaimed it, that no man comes to the Father but by me, and you can't even come to Jesus except that you are drawn and sent by the Father himself. God loves us, and God's desire is to keep us. He's promised to finish the work that he started and that he has begun within us. In the 8th verse, it says, listen. Now, there are some things that cause barriers to communication. First of all, if you are getting instruction, you can't be distracted. If you're in a classroom environment, you know you can't put your headphones on. You can't be next to somebody whose telephone is constantly ringing. You can't come to class not prepared, not having the pencil, the paper, the textbook, the notes, if you want to get instructions. Being able to listen means that you focus on what's being said. Being able to listen means that when you come to church, you have your Bible with you, or you're using one of the Bibles, or you're writing down notes so that you can get the most out of the sermon that's being taught. It says, my son, listen to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And it puts together a one-two punch here. There are some things that the father teaches and there are some things that the mother teaches. You can't negate one and place the other above. It takes them both to be together. Now, in some households, there are both parents within the household. Some households are single parents, okay? Some households, you get instruction not only from the parent that's within the household, but you get instruction from other adults that you encounter throughout life. There were a lot of men and women that influenced me when I was growing up, and I was learned I, taught, I was taught to rather listen to them, to respect them. And guess what? I found out that each one of them gave me a piece of wisdom, a piece of knowledge, a piece of instruction, and it enabled me to be able to go on this journey, this thing that we call life. It says, my son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with what me, come along with us, let us, let us lie in wait for innocent blood, and let's ambush some harmless soul. Now, this is interesting, because it describes something here, when you, when you do the historical analysis of the text, called brain bridge or vein bridge. Basically what happens is that as people are traveling along the road, they lie in ambush and they catch them uh, with their guard down unsuspecting and they jump on them and rob them. You remember the gentleman in the Bible that was on his way down to Jericho and the scripture says that he fell among thieves. As it relates to wisdom, what it deals with is being able to think when somebody presents you with an opportunity or idea or suggestion. What it says is that your teaching is supposed to kick in place. Your teaching is supposed to say to you, now this is not the way that I want to go. And if you go, go from boyhood to manhood, 
if you go go from being a little girl to a woman, you're going to have to be able to tell some people no. And there are some things out there that look good. There are some things out there that sound good, but they lead to destruction. For example, there's no such thing as fast, easy money. There's no such thing as getting something for free. Everything has two costs, at least one of them, I should say. Either it's implicit or it's explicit. Some things you pay for with money. Some things you pay for in time. There are some traps out there that we need to be aware of. First of all, one of the greatest traps that's out there now is the payday loan. Payday loans sound great, but in reality, here's how they work. If you borrow $500, they want you to be able to pay back the $500 plus interest. Sounds good, but what if you can't pay it back? Well, they're more than happy to extend the term of the loan. For a nominal fee, you know, now you owe $500 plus interest still, plus they keep the money and don't even give you credit for it. This is what makes payday loans such a trap. Some people depend upon gambling. A lot of people have squandered away life earnings trying to hit the big mega bucks. Some people, even after they hit it, end up in the worst situation than they were before they hit it. Sometimes people spend unusual amounts of money on get-rich-quick schemes. And they forget about the principles that you have to follow. They forget about the things that you have to do. We can't take advantage of people in order to further our own livelihood. If we do that, then we negate God's blessing. So we must be able to think. We must be able to examine situations. It says, now wisdom cries without. She utters her voice in the streets. Now this is a term in literary we call personification. Personification basically means we give human-like attributes to something that's inanimate, something that's not human. Because we know that wisdom is not an actual person, but we're saying that the call for wisdom the need for wisdom, God's desire for us to have knowledge and understanding and instruction is a cry. God does not want us to stay on the level and just shrug our shoulders at life circumstances saying we know to everything that comes about. Okay? So when we get this instruction, when we get this teaching, then we are able to make the decisions that we need to make. When we get the knowledge that we need, when we understand the way that we should go, the Bible says it like this, that there's a wide path and then there's a narrow path. But what wisdom does, what instruction does, what teaching does, tells us that it's better to stay on the narrow path where there are few travelers than be on what's known as the highway to hell. But we have to have to be careful about these things. We have to be careful about the choices that we make. It says that on the top of the wall she cries out. As the city gates, she makes her speech. Verse 22. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? I want to share something with you. Three people are identified, three specific people. These three people are identified as mockers. They are identified as simple, and they are identified as fools. Now, what's the difference between them? Well, I'm glad you asked. It said the simple are naive ones who are spiritually immature and unguarded in their minds. They are influenced, and they are easily led astray by those who do not have their best interest in mind. Now, the Word of God calls these uh, simple people. See, this is why you cannot neglect 
your spiritual growth. The word of God said the purpose for believers coming to church is so that they can be equipped. They can be fortified. They are able to stand and they know. Because see, everybody don't have your best interest in mind. Every, everybody ain't looking out for what you're looking out for. Then it says they are the mockers or the scorners. Now watch what it said. It says they reject and despise what is holy. And in their pride and in their arrogance, they deem themselves above spiritual critique and wise advice. The thing that lets you know that you're dealing with somebody like this is that they catch phrases, it don't take all that. You can identify them because when you start to tell them what does said the Lord, when you start to tell them what's right, what's holy, what God would have us to do, they want to reference what's going on across town. They don't do it like that over there. And they give example after example as to why we should do it. But I want to ask you a question. When has God ever said something to you that will cause you harm? When has God ever given you some instruction that lead to your demise? Everything God meant for you is meant for good. So who we go for? The word of God said, my sheep know my voice, but a stranger they will not follow. So we can't follow the strange voice. We got to follow the voice that's been keeping us all of these years. It says they are puffed up in pride and in arrogance. You normally find people like this are highly educated but spiritually mature. Everything to them have to make sense. And if it don't make sense according to man's law, they don't want to do it. Okay? People like this will never walk on water. They'll never believe in, in healing. They'll never believe in deliverance. They'll never do the greater works that Jesus promised. Because everything has to make sense to them. Nothing is spiritual. Everything is cardinal. But if you go operate on the spiritual plane, then we have to try God at his word. This is what made Peter so unique. Peter resolved within himself, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. I know it don't make sense what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you are walking on water. That don't make sense to me, but I want to be sure for myself. So if it's really you, I know you got the power to go beyond my carnality. I know you got the power to put me on this supernatural plane. Some of us are limited because we don't want to get out the boat. Even though we have an open invitation, we want to stay where we are. Consequently, this is why it takes some of us so long to get to the places that we desire to go because we spend a whole lot of time just trying to figure it out and work it out on our own recourse. It says, finally, we deal with some people that they call the fools. It says, fools hate knowledge because both true knowledge and godly wisdom expose corruption. Now you got to watch this now. First of all, the Bible issues a warning. It says, the fool has says in his heart that there is no God. We talked about that. Then the Bible says we're not supposed to call anyone fool. So whosoever do so is in danger of hell's fire. To put a person on a level of being a fool endangers not only their soul because you're speaking a word curse on them, okay, and you're also contradicting what the word of God said. So if fools, according to the scripture, devalue wisdom, okay, because it goes against the flesh, then we put them in a bad situation. We joke about it all the time. We get around our friends and say, oh, girl, you ain't got no sense. You a fool, and you laugh and joke about it. But there's some characteristics that go along with being a fool. There's some characteristics that go along with being crazy. And if those characteristics don't line up with the way God will have you to be, then you shouldn't want any part of it. Okay? It said that what makes them fools and see, you don't have to ask a person how they are. You have to just watch them. 
Don't the word say you know a tree by the fruit that is back? I like plums. I like blackberries. But guess what? I can't go to a blackberry vine and pick plums off of it. I can't go to the plum tree and expect to see watermelons dangling from the limbs. So you know people by the fruit they buy. It ain't what they say, it's what they do. So when someone tells you that it don't make sense to them, you can't tell them. You've heard people say this, you can't tell me nothing. They made up in their mind who they go be. You know some people that you've been trying to talk to all your life. Some of them get it, some of them don't. You know, I was in school with some for nine months. They still stuck on page one. We get ready to go out to classroom, go to the next grade. They still on page one. So you got to watch it. You got to watch how you reject knowledge. You got to watch how you reject teaching. Some people got a certain teacher. They got to have it. But if you go go out for knowledge, you got to be able to extract something from anybody that God has put in front of you. Even on your job, you don't have to agree with everything that your supervisor, your manager, your boss do. But they're in position because somebody put them in position. God put them in position. And they're there to equip you in certain areas. And it's your job to give them the respect that they deserve. And when God gets ready to shift you, then he'll shift you. So don't devalue wisdom. Don't always be led by the flesh. Now watch this. When you're spiritually immature, you can be easily influenced. What happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota is a tragedy. There's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of prejudice that goes along with that incident. But the word of God said two wrongs don't make a right. You can't let people trick you into going out doing unlawful, ungodly things. For example, looting, rioting, killing innocent people, assaulting police officers will not bring Mr. Floyd back. The word of God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I'll pay you. We learned in the military, I'm a veteran, that we have to use effective weapons. If we're going against soft structures, you know, we use things called mortars. If we're going against hardened structures, we use artillery, air strikes, or land strikes. We have to learn how to be spiritually violent. The word of God said that heaven suffers violence, and violence takes us by force. That's not physical force. That's spiritual force. We have to learn how to do what they did back in the civil rights era. Except this time, instead of marching in the streets, we marching in the courts. We marching to our governors. We're marching to our legislature. We're demanding that the same law that you hold us to, you use it to hold that these people that were in position, you hold them accountable by the same standard. But don't let anyone trick you. And why is this a trick? And no one seems to grasp this. You know, sometimes they talk about, in my opinion, the wrong thing on TV. No one has said there's a corona, but every time there's a cure for coronavirus, but every time I see protesters, they out there and they ain't got no mask on. Every time I see them out there, they ain't nobody testing, ain't nobody checking. You're breathing in. Not only air of anger and of rage, but you forgot all about social distancing. You so wrapped up and tied up in what's going on, you forgot about the fact that it's an invisible threat that's out there. Now you're dealing with two enemies. Now you're dealing with injustice. You're dealing with hatred, racism, and you're still dealing with the invisible. So you got to be careful. You got to think. You got to be effective at what you say and at what you do. As we wrap this lesson up, it said, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Have you ever noticed it just takes so long to do some simple things, and then you see somebody that do the same thing that you was planning to do, 
and they do it in a very short amount of time. And you ask yourself, why? Why it take us so long to do that? That's baffling. Everybody want to be on the winning team, but no one wants to commit to the practice. No one wants to commit to the diligence. And what happens is we want God to bless us with this overflow. But we complacent in what we do. We drag our feet. Paul called them slow bellies, you know. And you can read it in the scripture. I'm not picking on someone. I'm not trying to belittle anyone. But we got to be about God's business. He said that their complacency, the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whosoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Not only do we have to not be complacent, but we have to listen. Because when we listen to God, we get something. We get joy. We get some peace. We get some understanding. And we get to live without fear. We go anywhere we want to go. But when it comes time to go to church, there's an excuse, there's a reason. If they told us that we had to go to work and work 10 hours a day, we wouldn't have no problem with it. You know? But we make excuses for God. And we act like he don't see that. We act like he don't know that, that, that we are picking other things over him. Last time I checked the scripture, he said he was a jealous God. He admonishes us that we'll have no other God before him. Don't you know when you put something else before God, you, you're dealing in idolatry? You're making whatever you're placing before your time with God, your God. That's what idolatry is. I pray and hope that you've gotten something out of this lesson. And as you listen to this, share it with your co-workers, share it with your friends. And by all means, give us your feedback. Let us know if there are questions that you can answer or points that you want to expound upon. But above all, practice wisdom, practice knowledge, practice understanding. We thank you for the time that we have and we don't take it for granted. That whatever we say, whatever we do, lines up with the will of God and with the purpose of God. We want to pray with you now that perhaps you've heard something within this lesson that you can use, that you can share with someone else. And I don't want you to use this time like it, but I just want you to pause for a moment as I lead you into prayer that the Holy Spirit will come in tie this lesson to the chambers of your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to teach and study your word. We thank you for the audience that you've given us. We thank you, Father God, that you're still working on us and you promised that you will finish the work that you have begun. God, we desire to do greater works for you. We desire now, Father God, that you will be with us, strengthen us, and guide us in everything that we do. Cover us in our blood. Give your angels charge to watch over us. Place a bloody thorn in head to protection around us. And God, we receive open door blessings, supernatural prosperity. We thank you for our help, our strength, and the cancellation of all sickness within our bodies. God, we thank you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we move from one level to the next level. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the redeemed of God say, Amen. 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 Our lesson was called, The Call to Work to Wisdom, taken from Proverbs 1, 1 and 33. It can be summed up simply, if you lack wisdom, ask of the Lord. Amen.